Hello and welcome to Polk Pioneers Oral History Program, a collaboration between the Polk County Historical Association and the Polk County History Center. I'm Murtis Young, Historic Preservation Manager for the Polk County History Center. Thank you for joining us today as I have the pleasure to speak with Mr. Royce Kenneth Godwin, a lifelong resident of Polk County, presently living in Lake Wales and formerly of Frostproof and Berea. Mr. Godwin will be sharing memories about his life in and around Frostproof, Fort Meade, and Berea. Thank you for joining me today, Mr. Godwin. Thank you very much for having me. It is a joy to have this conversation with you. So to start our conversation, so tell me, were you born in Polk County? I was born 11 miles southwest of Frostproof and 16 miles southeast of Fort Meade, a little area called Streety Lake, and it goes into Berea also. And we know that Berea is a pretty historical community, so I'm looking forward to hearing more about life, the early pioneer life in Berea. So tell us, share with us a little bit about your parents, your grandparents, when they arrived in Polk County, and what brought them here? Well, let me tell you a little bit about my, my great-great-grandfather was uh, born in North Carolina mm -hmm. in uh, 1771. That wow. goes back a long time. It does. He died it in uh, 1820 mm -hmm. in North Carolina. He had eight children and four grew to be grown. The other four deceased. Mm -hmm. Now, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, uh, came to Polk County. I believe they called it Hillsborough County back then, or yes, is Polk, that right? That is correct because Polk County was not formed until 1861 okay. by legislative act, so you're correct. It was yeah. Hillsborough County at that time. So my, my great-grandfather came to Polk County uh, in Fort Meade, mm -hmm. and uh, he is buried there in Fort Meade with his first wife. Now he was quite a gentleman, I'll tell you. Uh, he was a uh, in his for in the armed forces, mm -hmm. he was in the in uh, Seminole War, mm -hmm. and also in the Civil War. That's correct. Yeah. And he's uh, buried there in Fort Meade with a iron fence around his grave and his wife. I visited that many many years ago. So we have a pretty strong connection to the Fort Meade area. And um, I'm just curious a little bit about your father. Let's start with him and sort of what his life was like in these early years. Well, my father was born in Sefner. Okay. That's, over, that's mm -hmm. still in Hillsborough County. Uh, my father was a hard worker. My father uh, homesteaded. Right. In uh, just south, south east of Lake Wells mm -hmm. uh, from Indian Lakes Estates to Kissimmee River in that area. Mm -hmm. He homesteaded uh, 160 acres of that land and he built a log cabin on that land of 160 acres. Then my father went into World War I mm -hmm. and uh, he married my mother while he was in Pensacola. That's where he was stationed. Very interesting. Married to my mother. And my father then went to France on a troop ship. And when they got to France, he, uh, he did not get off. No one got off of the ship because it had a flu epidemic. And my father also had pneumonia along with the flu. Oh. So they turned right around and came back to Florida or Pensacola. They, that's where they ended up at. And uh, that was... Uh, a quite interesting trip that my father used to tell me, tell me about. And then my father was a rancher. Mm -hmm. uh, he, when he, he had this 160 acres right. at, uh, that he homesteaded on, he ended up selling that 160 acres to a group in Paris, France. And uh, for 160 acres for $1,600. Wow. <laughs> I believe that's $100 an acre, right? And, but my father took that money and then he bought uh, five acres uh, in Frostproof, just a little out of town in Frostproof. Mm -hmm. But then he ended up uh, 
uh, going on out to Streety Lake, which is Streety Lake's a part of Berea. And uh, he built a home there and he set up 15 acres of land uh, to citrus. Mm -hmm. And that's where I was born. And what do you remember about that? Yeah. Right? Tell us your memories about life in Berea. Well, of course, I was uh, born in that house, and it burned down when I was a year old. And Daddy bought another house then down next to the lake. And uh, my mother taught school at that time. In that time, if you went to Bartow, to the county seat, and passed the test, then you were eligible to teach school. That sure has changed from yeah. then to now. But my mother taught school for several years mm -hmm. until I started the school uh, in 1933. And uh, then mother didn't teach no more, but till later on she substitute taught. But we moved off from Streety Lake then. We moved on. Uh, my daddy traded a 15-acre grove that he had set out in the house to uh, old Uncle Ed Hilliard, who was a Civil War veteran in Frostproof, the only one in Frostproof. Interesting. And Daddy traded his property for 40 acres of land on out in Berea area, mm -hmm. in uh, just three miles uh, west of Street Lake. Mm -hmm. And there he, uh, he farmed and, uh, and he accumulated land and he had cattle. And my dad never did work off as long as I was, can remember. He always took care of his own cattle. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and my mother uh, taught school some, and then whenever she became not eligible to teach school, then she worked in the L. Maxi canning plant during the fruit season. Mm -hmm. But they, uh, they worked hard. We had our own vegetables. Uh, Daddy would butcher a cow or steer, and then he'd butcher a hog, and we had chickens about ever <laughs> fried chicken about every Sunday. Yeah. So we had a, just a, a family working system. Mm -hmm. And my daddy bought land, and mother, and they were very conservative. And let me tell you about that. Okay. We didn't have electricity until I was 18 years old. Okay. We didn't have a indoor facilities. We had uh, no running water. We had a pitcher pump for water. So I was brought up studying in, in school. I studied with a lamp, a kerosene lamp. Wow. That's what we had to, to uh, study by. Now, my daddy was, it's very odd. My daddy was a self-centered individual. He never used that bathroom outdoor. We had a outdoor facilities, mm -hmm. but my daddy never used that. He was such a f cattle man and farmer that he would just go out in the woods. Now that's, that was always been a mystery to me all my <laughs> life, but my daddy was a, that type of a, of a person. But daddy uh, just worked hard and accumulated more property and more mm -hmm. cattle. Mm -hmm. And I have, uh, I have three older brothers one deceased at, at young age, and my sister. Mm -hmm. But my father and mother gave each one of us 90 acres of land. And uh, so I, and he also, when we was one year old, he uh, marked and branded a little heifer calf for each one of the children. How beautiful. And that was a, a starting point in my, uh, my, my lifestyle uh, was right there with my father. But I'd, I, I had to come in from school. Now you got to remember this is back in the, in the Depression. It was just getting over the Depression. Okay. But I can remember the, somewhat in the Depression where I had cousins that worked for a dollar a day wow. clearing land. Now I never had to do that because I was too young. Mm -hmm. But getting back to my father and, and mother, but my father, uh, accumulated approximately 500 acres mm -hmm. of ranch land. Mm -hmm. And then he leased a lot of land from uh, Atlantic Land Improvement Company. Okay. Uh, and he run several hundred head of cattle. And I, would, I was brought up on a horse. <laughs> My daddy gave me a little horse when I was about uh, ten, 10 years old. 
So I was brought up on my own horse, and I'd cow hunt with my dad. And back then, they, uh, in the ranch land, we had a lot of what we call gopher holes. Oh. And now then, they don't have them gopher holes. They, they've kind of done away with them because it were dangerous for the horses would run. We'd be rounding up cattle, and then the horse would fall into a gopher hole. But uh, I was uh, about 16 years old. And uh, I remember that uh, coming in from school, I'd have to, my daddy would tell me, now I want you to do this when you get home from school. Uh, and, and you know, it was, uh, I either had to go to the garden, we grew, we grew our own vegetables, we had grew strawberries, we grew sugar cane, they made syrup, and uh, I had to work in the little grove, we had a 10 acre orange grove, and, and my daddy would tell me exactly what to do when I got home from school. I had to change clothes and grab me a biscuit or a sweet potato and do whatever my dad had told me. And I had better do that exactly the way he said. Good for you. Now, I can, uh, would, you want me to talk about school? I do. I'm really curious you mentioned your mother is teaching school at a certain point and you're going to school. And so tell us about the schools during this period of time. Okay. Where were you in school? Okay, we had a little school in Berea. Mm -hmm. and the name of the school was Athens. Athens. And they had two grades, one through the fourth and fifth through the eighth. Okay. Now we had moved from Street of Lake to Berea and it was about a mile and a quarter from our house to the school and I walked every day uh, at school to there and back. But uh, we had one teacher that taught one through the fourth, okay. and one teacher that taught fifth through the eighth. Okay. And uh, after that, whenever I finished my eighth grade, it was during the, we, I, that, this time we was in the war, started World War II. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was uh, a farm boy, so in Fort Meade they had a summer school because this was during the war and they need all the help they could get from us teenagers that worked in the farm and citrus. And so I went to summer school in Fort Meade and it, I rode the bus back and forth. It was 16 miles to wow. Fort Meade wow. from daddy. And my daddy would go into Fort Meade about every two weeks and buy commodities, what they call commodities. Mm -hmm. That would be flour and what have you, and feed for the animals. And uh, he would always uh, get a 50 pound chunk of ice. And that was a treat for us because we never had ice. Uh, and I remember my mother would make iced tea and that was a big, big treat for oh, us. Oh, how lovely. And uh, my daddy would always, uh, drive very slow. He was a poor car driver. He was a better, <laughs> better horseback rider than he was a driver of a car. He drove about 10 miles an hour, so it took him an hour and a half from Berea to Fort Meade. And sometimes I would go with him. And I recall when I was just starting in first grade, I was six years old, mm -hmm. and uh, I had a dime. And my, my uh, mother had given me a 10 cents so I went in the dime store, it was five and 10 cent store in Fort Meade, to buy me a little notebook because I was starting to school. Oh. Well, I seen a pencil there, a, a little mechanical pencil that uh, it just charmed me and I didn't have no money to buy that pencil. And uh, that was uh, my first experience of, of really disciplinary. I uh, picked up that pencil and <laughs> took it home with me. Well, there my mother and dad said to me, where did you get this pencil? I said, well, I bought this notepad with my dime and I just picked up the pencil. <laughs> so I had to go back to Fort Meade with my dad when he went back the next time, went into the five and 10 cent store, had to apologize to the man that owned it, and then my dad bought me that, uh, that pen. That was a big experience in my life of uh, honesty. Mm -hmm. uh, what a know, great father. You don't father. take something yeah. that don't belong to you. But what a great but, father. But, that is but a I good can story. Remember, you know, being 91 years old, I can remember that 85 years ago. It made an impression. And, uh, mm -hmm. So, but uh, 
we always had plenty to eat. That's one thing that we did have. Uh, we had vegetables. We had, had to have pork. He'd butcher steer. And, and uh, that was different than the city folks. Right. During the hard time, during the Depression. During the Depression. At the end of the Depression, this was kind of in the end of it where I came along. But my dad was very successful in, uh, in purchasing land. I remember he'd buy some land for uh, $10 an acre. My goodness. Yeah. Uh, I, in, my, in my school days, though, in Fort Meade, I had two teachers that were my cousins. Okay. Helen Godwin, one of the school teachers there at Fort Meade, and Carolyn Dobson was kin to me on my mother's side. Okay. And, uh, of course, I was a little mischievous uh, because I took advantage <laughs> of my kin folks as my teacher. <laughs> and uh, so Helen Godwin wrote a note for me to take to my daddy, and I think it was kind of a disciplinary uh, note, but daddy didn't get the note. I, I, I did it. She didn't send it by me, and I had done away with the note because <laughs> I, I knew what was going to happen because he was a disciplinary. And uh, but, but that was a, just one of the little incidents there. Then on my senior year, I went three years to Fort Meade. That was okay. in 1941, 42, and part of 43. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you something else about my school days there in Fort Meade. I lived in, so far in the country, 16 miles from uh, the school, and I wanted to play football. But I couldn't because I couldn't get back and forth 16. Right. I had to ride a school bus. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but the coaches liked me because I love sports. Coach Ashmore and Coach Carter was their names. And uh, they let me go to the ball games with them on the bus. Nice. And we used to, I remember coming here to Bartow, <laughs> play Bartow Summerlin. Uh, yeah, they could, that's, right. that's what they, yeah. and uh, we had a good, we had good teams at Fort Meade. We was a Ridge Conference championships there. So, but that was a big treat for me to even get to, I was a water boy. I cared a water boy. Good and, for you. Uh, my senior year, I went to uh, Frostproof, now, which was 11 miles in, in senior year. Now, remember, I didn't get the education in summer school that, that you would get in the other school because I only went six months. Okay. So. I, f I was a little bit behind, but I was good in math. And of course, I was a, a student in agriculture because I, I had my own cows and my horse. But uh, uh, I wanted to play football again on my senior year. Okay. So I learned how to cut meat in a meat market there at, at, uh, in 1943, end of 43 and 44, okay. 1944. <clears throat> and I learned how to cut meat. And my mother rented a place over the little Raymond Theater, uh, my first cousin lived there, and my mother paid her $20 a week, I remember, for me to live there and eat, and I learned to cut meat. And then I, I did play football that senior year, and, and uh, we only had 16 boys on a football team. Okay. We, uh, it was during the war, during, right in the middle of the war, mm -hmm. and uh, we had to go to the games uh, our own way, in our own cars. My buddy had an old Model A Ford, and I remember we drove that thing to the, to the foot. We played teams like uh, Bartow, uh, uh, Fort Meade, uh, Haines City, Auburndale, Sebring, Avon Park, closer <laughs> in because we didn't have gas. The buses, they wouldn't allow us to drive the bus. The coach had to get his own vehicle there. But uh, in, in high school there, I, in my senior year, uh, I, I made pretty good grades and everything, but uh, geography. I wasn't good in geography, but I was good in math, and of course I was good in math and agriculture, and made A's in uh, and also uh, physical education because I love sports. It was a uh, it was quite a experience back there in, in our in our senior year, and uh, I knew when you turned 18 you're going to be drafted okay. into the service. Mm -hmm. I, uh, at that time, and I didn't want to go into the Army, I wanted to go into the Navy. I was kind of a water brought up around lakes and what have you, in, in the frostproof area. So 
at that time, if you uh, would go to Jacksonville and join the Navy before you was your birthday, my birthday was on April the 26th. I was born April 26, right. 1926. And uh, I went into the, into the, uh, elevator, uh, into the, uh, the post office building in Jacksonville now, okay. this was many years ago, and rode the elevator. First elevator I ever rode was in wow. Jacksonville when I joined the Navy. And that was on April the 18th, okay. before I was April 26th, so before my birthday. Now they let me come back to Frostproof okay. and if my senior year and finish high school if I made good grades, in which I was making good grades, and let me finish high school. Okay. On June the 2nd, I graduated from Frostproof High School. And June the 5th, I was on my way to Camp Perry, Virginia. Would you like me to carry on? You know, I, I do. Before we leave school, high school, and, and what life was, early life in um, Berea, a couple of things I'm curious about. I've heard strong family, very strong family, great father providing leadership, worked very hard. Yeah. You enjoyed football, you, but what else did you do for fun during this period of time well, when you were in school? And let me tell you about what we did for fun. Okay. We, you know, we didn't know any different. We was country people. We didn't know anything about this fancy stuff. We, uh, we'd go out on Sunday afternoons. We went to church on Sunday. Okay. Now, I'll, I, I got to mention that church. My mother was a staunch primitive Baptist member, and I had to go to church. And they'd have two or three preachers on Sunday. Two or three. And I would, Mama would require me to sit through one service. Okay. And then I could go out in the yard and play with the rest of the kids. But uh, the Primitive Baptist Church was real strict back then too. They, they didn't, but they didn't have music in their church. Okay. They still don't. Okay. Uh, they don't uh, pay their pastors. They work for a living just like anybody else. And they give them a little spending money. But uh, getting back to my childhood days of what we did, we'd play football tackle football on Sunday afternoons in the cow pasture. <laughs> Out in the cow pasture. The boys all over Berea would come together and we'd choose upside and we'd actually play tackle. Let me tell you about something. Now, I had a little bicycle. Now, I sold grit newspapers. G-R-I-T. That was back then was a paper for a nickel. Okay. Yeah, I would keep two cents. I had to give them three cents. I sold enough papers and riding that bossy on dirt roads <laughs> that I accumulated enough money to buy me a bicycle. Ooh. So one Sunday afternoon we was gathered together to play tackle football and I laid my bicycle right up next to the cattle fence. Now this was at my father's ranch where I did this. And we was out there playing football and I seen this car stop and they stopped and opened the trunk and throwed my bicycle <gasps> in that trunk. Oh, how disappointing. And I, that, that was a disappointment of one of my biggest disappointments of my life. Heartbreaking. When they stole my bicycle. And I had to ride miles and miles of dirt road to, for a nickel and had to give three cents of that back to the publishing company. Heartbreaking. That's what, and another thing we did was uh, we had, uh, now remember out in Berea, most of us were kin folks. Okay. Most of all of us was first cousins, uncles, and aunts. And... Uh, <laughs> We'd have weenie roast. That was excitement. That was our big deal. Or, or we'd have roast marshmallows. Wonderful. And that would be at different people's houses in, okay. uh, at, in the evenings. And all of us were kin folks, cousins. Uh, but we found ways to entertain ourselves. I can, I go back now and think about when I was about seven years old, we moved out to the to, to the ranch, the, the father in, in Breer, mm -hmm. and uh, I'd take an old broomstick, <laughs> and I'd ride that broomstick around like it was a horse. <laughs> now that was entertainment. Sure. I have a, uh, on Christmas, uh, as an example, mother made our clothes. Most, uh, you could go in the grocery store and buy flour, and they'd have a, a flour that it had different designs on it that mother would make 
shirts out of it. And okay. feet also had designs, okay. patterns, I guess is what you, but uh, mother would make our clothes and I was so proud of that. Oh, how sweet. And I still got her sewing machine, <gasps> old Minnesota. She, it was one of them paddle deals that you sat there and paddled it and back and forth. Uh, but you know, we had, uh, uh, we just didn't know any different there. We just a happy family mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. Disciplinarian. We didn't steal. We didn't lie. We went to church and we worked. And we always had an old saying later in life that I, I always made this motto of uh, by working is early to bed and early to rise, work like hell and fertilize. <laughs> that was what I always said uh, as a little motto of growing up. It's a good formula. But, uh, that's about what we did for uh, for amusement. That's just uh, we didn't have no movie. We didn't. I didn't go. No, I I remember my mama taking me to one movie, way back, and, and that movie was Gone with the Wind. I don't know. I, I don't remember much about it. And I remember another time where I went to a country music. I was about ten years old. That'd be eighty something years ago. The Roy Acuff and the. Uh, Roy Acuff, the country music singer, and the Smoky Mountain Boys there in Fort Meade at the old football field. Wow. That's amazing. But, That's good. Couldn't sing in church, but I'm glad you got to go listen to these performers. Well, I, <laughs> that, that was it. I went to... <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So I'm glad to hear all the wonderful ways that you all got to spend time with family and play, and I wonder if you're down that far away in the southeastern part of the county, what happened if you got sick? What was happening? Well, good question. When I was 12 years old, I got sick in the stomach. And uh, my mother had a way that every six weeks, we took a round of purgative medicine. <laughs> we didn't go to the doctor. We didn't have no doctor. Okay. But uh, you, you had to go through that routine. <laughs> but when I was 12 years old, uh, I got appendicitis. And they thought that I was just sick and they gave me castor oil. Ooh. And that's even worse. And I almost died. And they finally got me rushed to the county hospital in Bartow. Up here. Mm -hmm. That's the only mm -hmm. hospital in, in uh, that time. We was a country people. We... Uh, I don't know that Daddy had to pay anything or not. I don't think he did. But anyway, I had that surgery. And I remember going to old Dr. Rue one time in uh, Fort Meade, a dentist. And that's the only time that I ever went to, we just didn't, we didn't get sick. Didn't get sick. <laughs> Mom was taking care Mama of that. Would, <laughs> Mama would make sure religiously that we were taken care of. Good, good. And she was, my mother was a hard worker. Uh, she was uh, what I refer to as a go-getter. Mm -hmm. My daddy was, uh, he took life as it came, but he was smart. And uh, I, I, I want to tell you something about my grandfather. Again. Oh, I want to hear. Okay. When my grandfather, he died at 51 years old. Young. With skin cancer. He went all the way to Minnesota, to that big hospital in Minnesota. Okay. Came back by train and he... Uh, it didn't help him any, and he died at 51. But before he died, he had eight children, and he had given each one of those ch child 40 acres of land. Marvelous. Now, that was the, the way the Godwin family would get all the way back, as far as I can remember, and even what I've read about, always give the next generation a head start, a little money, a property, or, or whatever it might be, but something to give them, to get them started in life, in the marriage life, so. That's but, beautiful. The but I remember my grandfather gave yeah. my, and uh, they live right out in, in Berea too, uh, my mm -hmm. grandparents. Mm -hmm. It's a great legacy, land and good yeah. work ethic yeah. and strong family ties. Yeah. That's a great legacy. Yeah. Um, well, okay, before we leave childhood, there's one other question. One of our favorite historic sites in Polk County is Kissingen Spring. Do you ever get a chance to go to Kissingen Spring? Oh, yes. What was that like? I learned Kissingen Springs when I went to Fort Meade High School. Of course. Because it's right here between Fort Meade and Bartow. 
And uh, we used to sometimes play a little hooky sometimes oh. from school and go to Kissing Springs. And it was cold water, <laughs> but it was a great swimming. That's the only place we had really to go swimming in a cool swimming mm -hmm. pool. Mm -hmm. And when I was a senior in high school and I'd go into Frostproof now on our senior night, that's where we went on senior night was to Kissing Springs. It was a big deal to us. Oh, that sounds it was, lovely. Now as they've done away with it, I understand. Yeah, the, the spring is dry now. Back then, it was, a, it was a place for us to go in Fort Meade and the surrounding areas. Mm -hmm. And Frost Brew, there. We, we always enjoyed going to Kiss. It was a big deal. And you would actually go there at night and swim in that cold right, water swim. at night. My we'd, goodness. You know, we'd, we, our whole class, our senior class went there. And it was it in the evening that we we went, but uh, Kissinger Springs was always the number one spot back then for us uh, to go to school and have fun uh, to, to, to entertain ourselves. Sure. Well, I love these stories; they're great. I just appreciate so much learning about your early life, growing up, going to school, playing, having family time. So, tell me, do you recall when when the uh, Pearl Harbor was attacked. Do you have memories of that? Do you know where you were, how you heard the stories, and what impact that had on you? Well, that was in December the 7th, I believe, in 1941. Mm -hmm. And I was, at that time, I was a freshman okay. in high school, in Fort Meade, mm -hmm. in summer school. And at, at home, we didn't have access to, uh, we didn't have television. Right. Yet. We didn't even have a radio. Okay. But, but, you heard it through the school and heard it, you know, and uh, it, it wanted to uh, make you want to do something yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, I always mm -hmm. had that desire mm -hmm. uh, to, to be in the military. Okay. And, uh, but I, I do remember, and, uh, but I was a freshman in high school. Freshman. And you know, we didn't have access to the, to the media. We didn't have mm -hmm. access to nothing except somebody telling you something. Mm -hmm. So that's the way you got the news of the that's war. That's the way from, kind of we, we got uh, it. Yes. So then you finish school, now we've gone to Jacksonville, and you come back and you graduate, and then you join the Navy. So tell us about your Navy life. Okay. All right, I, uh, as I said, I, I was, uh, I joined the Navy, Navy April the 18th of 1944. Mm -hmm. And I got the call on June the 2nd. Okay. And I had a good buddy of mine uh, live next door to me in Berea, Frank Clements, and he and I went to Jacksonville and joined together. We both got a tattoo on our arm, <laughs> way high. We didn't, you know, I didn't want my mama to see it much, but, <laughs> but uh, then I had to go to boot camp. Okay. And uh, I went to Camp Perry, Virginia. Okay. Never been away from home. Mm -hmm. And the first letter I got from my dad, I sat down and cried. I could, it was just, I was homesick. Yeah. You can visualize a little old country boy uh, from Berea and Frostproof and Fort Meade being in Richmond, Virginia and going to, to boot camp. I broke boot camp on October the 8th, okay. 1944. Okay. I came home for eight days. Okay. On the way back, I was traveling on a train. I'd never been on a train before. Mm -hmm. Uh, from uh, I travel from La West Lake Wells, right, yeah, to uh, to uh, Richmond, Virginia, and I was kind of sleeping, and they went to uh, Renosa somewhere in Virginia, and I thought they said Richmond, and I got off of the <laughs> the train, and then I had to catch a bus <laughs> to go into Richmond to get back to Camp Perry. When I broke boots in Camp Perry, they sent me to uh, California on a train, troop train. Long way. And that train took us four days and five nights to get there. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a troop train and, and nothing but Navy. And we lived on the train, we eat on the train, and uh, we went to Camp Shoemaker in uh, Oakland, California. Okay. And while I was there, I pulled Liberty uh, over in San Francisco. And me and a friend of mine uh, was in, in the Navy with me from Miami. He was, and his daddy was rich. He had money. And that's the reason I think I was buddy with him, because he <laughs> had the money. We was in the Palace Hotel in, in San Francisco, California. And uh, we had to 
we was only 18, so we had yeah. to be 21, just so we faked our Liberty card. <laughs> we all did that. that. And this lady came up between he and I and put her arm around both of us and, and says, uh, y'all don't know who I am. And I said, no. She said, I'm Joe DiMaggio's sister. Oh. Now, Joe DiMaggio was a great ball player for the New York Yankees. <laughs> right. I knew who he was. <laughs> and she, uh, she bought our drink. She it was just a nice, friendly, and, and, uh, but that was just a little coincidence there. But anyway, I got on a, <laughs> a ship in, in, uh, in, in the early part of November of okay. 1944 okay. on a troop trip. And uh, the name of it was the USS General S.D. Sturgis. It was nothing but servicemen. And going under the Golden Gate Bridge, I remember that very distinctly. Oh, sure. Then I ended up in Pearl Harbor. And uh, I was in Pearl Harbor about two weeks. I was there in Thanksgiving of 1944. Okay. And we had pineapple juice, pineapple cake, <laughs> pi everything pineapple. Well. They called my name for to get on the USS Wisconsin battleship that had just been christened, just built. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought I would maybe going back to the States to go to radio school. Uh, I didn't want to go on out there. That, the further you go west, the further you into the fighting. Well, I ended up on that battleship, and I ended up in, in Ulithia in the Caroline Islands, and that was the largest naval harbor in the United States service wow. in the Pacific Ocean. Wow. Where, that's where all the ships come in to get supplies, mm -hmm. fuel, and what have you. And the, now, I was on this battleship, and we pulled up right side of this old tanker, and it was all rusted, and I said, boy, I hope I don't go on that thing. <laughs> sure enough, that's where I went. <laughs> Guess what? That ship was named the USS Manatee. Okay. Named after the Manatee River here in Florida. Had your name on it. <laughs> had AO-58, USS Manatee. But the, the second day, I, I got on that on December the 23rd. And on December the 25th, we, uh, I was on a work detail. I was the lowest man on the totem pole. I was a, a seaman second class then. Okay. So my duty, I had to go over there and, and on Christmas Day and pick up beer cans and Coke cans. That was my duty, and I, I had a, a sandwich, a bologna sandwich for, for dinner on Christmas Day oh. of 1944. Uh, uh, we'll always remember that. I'll <laughs> always remember that. And I saw on that island, it was a little island called Mog Mog. That's where all the, the pilots comes off of the aircraft carrier. And all of the sailors, they go and get on sand. Okay. Being on water and you get on. Mm -hmm. I saw Admiral Nimitz and Admiral Halsey. I was about 20 feet from them. Wow. And that was a big deal for That's, me to see. Yeah, sure. And Admiral Nimitz was the top, top uh, admiral in World War II in, in mm -hmm. the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And Admiral Halsey was old Bull Halsey. He was tough. But uh, that's one day that I had on, on that manatee. But it was a ship that carried high octane gasoline for the aircraft carriers, for the airplanes. And then we had black oil and uh, other fuel that the ships operated on. And we carried, along with other ships, uh, other uh, tankers. Mm -hmm. But we was one of the fastest tankers. Okay. We could travel up close to around 20 knots, and that's, that's pretty fast mm -hmm. for that. And uh, we'd go along with the fighting ships, and what we would do would, uh, we, we would pump fuel over to the battleship like an aircraft carrier, and we'd be making 10 knots side by side and keep moving. And, and we'd make S's, S curves to keep submarines from, from finding us and getting a direct shot at us. Wow. But they'd be sending their airplanes off bombing, and uh, I, I could, no, Iwo Jima was was first, and then Okinawa that I was in that invasion. But we'd be fueling them air, airplanes, and they'd be flying, bombing, and come back landing on the aircraft carrier. Wow! And we uh, we went uh, right along when we needed when we'd run out of fuel, 
we had to come back either to Ulithia where the merchant marines would bring from the states would bring fuel. Mm -hmm. Now the merchant marines would only come within 100 miles of okay. the fighting zone. Mm -hmm. And then the Navy had to go out there. We had to go out and get the fuel and, and go on in the, in the fighting zones. But we never, uh, on the Manatee, and we was one of the top tankers. Mm -hmm. They called us the top tanker. Top tanker, okay. In World War II. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, the Japs went after us. They, uh, th that was a source of energy. Sure. And if they could get to stop the tankers, then the other places couldn't operate. That's right. <coughs> and so we, uh, we, had that, we had that duty, and, and like I said, I was in invasion of Iwo Jima and then Okinawa, and then we was going into the Philippine Islands. And the executive, and I'll never forget this, on a Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, our executive officer, that's next to the captain, called all the crew up on the cargo deck. And this is what he said. He said, gentlemen, we've had some close calls, but if we get out of this one alive, we'll be damn lucky. Wow. And I'll tell you, being a 19-year-old kid at that Hear time, that. that got to me. Sure. Now, we didn't have a Protestant aboard ship, but they had a Catholic, and I, I ended up going to that Catholic. So I said, boy, you got to get right. This. My time may come close. Mm -hmm. But we went on into, into the Philippines, fueled the ships. Now, this was the beginning of the end of the war. Right. The Japs' f fleet, all they had left, they had them up in the China Sea. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where we went up there to fuel the amphibious ships. Wow. And they, they backed up. That was the end of the uh, Navy of the Japanese. Okay. And while we was over there on the aisle, uh, board ship, I wanted to get off on the dirt. And we was in uh, Leyte in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, one of the boats there, they carried me over on the island just to get in. A, it was rice patch. They grew a lot of rice over there. And I caught malaria fever. Oh, no. And then I had that malaria fever, and, and uh, I took medicine for that. And then, then we, uh, we after, after we was in the Philippines, we was about 100 miles off of the coast of Tokyo, Japan, uh, when the war ended. Okay. And, uh, but my experience on that, I was, my duty when I first went on, was just a seaman. Okay. And I had to help when we, the ship would come along with us, alongside of us to get fuel. Mm -hmm. We'd shoot a line over there to them with a gun, and they'd put that line on a winch, and it would be like a half inch line, and then it would end up with one about four or five inches that we'd hold the, hold the hoses up where we'd pump the fuel over to the other ship. And remember, they was going, we was traveling all that time, they was fighting. Incredible. All that time we was pumping fuel. Incredible. But we, they, we was well escorted. We never went anywhere that we didn't have a lot of escorts. I'm talking about mm -hmm. battleships, carriers, okay. sure. cruisers. Uh, they protected. Yeah, uh, you're they, right. They protected uh, the the takers. You're Although right. my did my sister ship got sunk, uh, but we uh, we left. Uh, we went back into Ulithia, again, at the Carolina Islands. Mm -hmm. That was the biggest harbor in, in World War II. Mm -hmm. And we was, uh, they had a net all the way around that harbor where the ships, our ships come in, keep the Japs' submarines out. Okay, yeah. Well, we pulled out from the anchors in our sister ship, AO-59, uh, Miss Cinewan, pulled in in a uh, Jap two-man submarine, suicide submarine hit our sister ship broadcast and oh, sunk it. Oh. And they said it, it didn't take uh, just a few minutes for that ship to sink. They had fuel on there and it just exploded. Oh goodness, what a... And I, I'll tell you a quick story about that too. Sure. I, I live at, at, at the country club and this guy was playing golf. And uh, I said, you know, I was in the Navy. I never seen this guy before, you never seen me. And I said, I was in the Navy. And he said, well, I was in the Navy too. And uh, He's from Delaware. And I says, uh, well, I was on a tanker, Navy tank. He said, I was on a Navy tanker. <laughs> and uh, I, <laughs> I said, what tanker were you on? He said, Miss Sinema. I said, don't tell me another thing. I can tell you exactly what happened to that ship. And I told him, 
and he said, you're exactly right. And he was on uh, underneath the bridge, and he said it threw him about 60 yards when it exploded out into the water. Oh, my goodness. But they rescued. There was about 60 people got killed okay. of the sailors. Okay. And uh, That must be just incredible to meet someone like that and to have these shared stories of that incredible time in your life. But the, biggest, the biggest story I want to tell you. Okay. We was... Uh, in the fighting zone, mm -hmm. and uh, this destroyer, which was a fighting ship, came alongside of us to get fuel. And I seen this guy's head down below, and on his ship, they just got hit by a Jap suicide airplane. Yeah. And I saw this head, and I said, "Damn, that looks like James Lankford." And James Lankford was a guy that I graduated from high school with. <laughs> we both went in the Navy. I didn't know where he was at. He didn't know where I, and I, I, I hollered, I was up above him on top deck. I hollered Lankford and he turned around and sure enough it was him. Oh and, wow. And we hollered back and forth and the executive officer said, if y'all will shut up, I'll let you go over and visit with you. Nice. So That's he good, told me ladies. about, they got hit just the day before I saw him and they killed, I think he said 11 of them. Mm -hmm. And James Lankford's uh, son is Judge Lankford here in Polk County that I think he retired not long ago, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, James was a, a great friend of mine, and that, that was always a big, big story to me, to see, see a friend of mine that graduated from high school in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Absolutely. Just got hit by Japanese. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amazing stories. I can tell you much more, but go ahead. We'll have another conversation. I'm curious though, at this period of time, here you are in the Pacific Theater, um, when the atomic bombs are dropped on yes. um, the Japanese. Yes. What reaction did oh, you have Oh, that, that was a happy day. Yeah. We were getting ready to go into the, we were getting ready to invade the mainland. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, these Iwo Jima, Okinawa, and the other islands, were just it was islands was mm -hmm. owned by Japanese, but right. we were getting ready to go into the the real McCoy, mm -hmm. and uh, of course we were all young guys, and, and uh, uh, you know, was wanting to get the war over, and you're scared you're going to get killed or sunk or whatever. Uh, but aboard the ship, we have a, we had the radar gang and we had the radio gang, mm -hmm. and uh, I heard it through the radio gang. They picked up where the atomic bomb had been, and. Uh, and then a few days later, the, the, uh, they said the war was over. Mm -hmm. They told us, I remember that we ceased fire. They said cease fire. And then the Japanese hit one of our hospital ships. And then the next thing they said was says open fire. Oh. So, and then they did surrender. Okay. Uh, that, that was uh, a great, I guess that was the most rejoicing time of my life whenever I knew that the they had dropped the top of my and we knew then the war was going to be over. You knew that? And it was. Was there any indication that this was coming or was it a complete surprise to you? It was a complete surprise. Complete surprise. Yeah. And but then as soon as you heard that, you knew the implication was the war yeah. is going to come to yeah. an end. My job aboard that ship, I started off as a seaman on deck. Just, and uh, I had graduated from high school and I had tucked typing. And you know, a lot of the guys didn't have no uh, high school education. Right. It was kind of educated if you had a high school education mm -hmm. back then. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I went into the storekeeper, into the dispersing, taking care of the payroll, and oh, sure. and we had a little ship store. Uh, we called it a pogey bait store, <laughs> where we sold candy, cigarettes, and little is watches, stuff like that. It wasn't but about six foot wide and 10 feet long, just a little bit. Mm -hmm. But it had a porthole in it. And a porthole is where you get uh, open and you get fresh air coming into it. Nice. Well, it was so hot. It was so hot over there. Yeah. And uh, I slept in that little store <laughs> and where I had that, that, and it had, of course, asbestos around it. And I've ended up with asbestos. Now I've got asbestos for the lungs. Oh, from that incident, from, from being in that, okay. around that. Okay. 
the war has come to an end. And tell us about, you mustered out, where did you, what happened? That's another issue. <laughs> I got to tell you a little bit about, as soon as the war was over, mm -hmm. they, they sent us home. On the, we, the ship came into Long Beach, California. I came home for 20 days and I had to go right back. And while I was home, I wired the ship that uh, having a great time, request 10 day extension. And I got a wire back and said, extension not granted due to sailing orders. We already had orders to, to sail back to Japan. Oh. So we, we went back into Japan, into uh, Yokosuka and uh, Wakanara and, and uh, ended up in, uh, in Kobe. Okay. Kobe was the third largest city, I believe, in Japan. The ships, was, the, the harbors was, had bows of ships where the Japanese ships were sunk and, and uh, the people were just starving. They, they, it, was, it was really bad. It, uh, Kobe was pretty well flattened out. And, uh, but uh, uh, it was sad to see that. <laughs> but I was sure glad to see that war over. Yeah. Now we sure. made a trip and we went, we left uh, Kobe, Japan and went to Singapore. And from Singapore, we went to Colombo, Ceylon. Now Ceylon is a little, nobody's ever heard of that little country. It's in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Okay. Just a little, little island out there. And we stopped there overnight. And then we went on into the Persian Gulf mm -hmm. up in the Bahrain, Arabia and got a load of oil. Okay. And we come back and we came into Incheon, Korea. And that's where I left the ship. I had a good friend who was a yeoman. A yeoman is like a secretary to the captain. Okay. And, and I was in the storekeeper gang, so. But anyway, his name was Whitey Slater from Long Island, New York. <laughs> and uh, he came to me and he said, Royce, if you can get off of this ship, you got enough points to get out of here, go home. Whoa. So, but he said, you're going to have to leave before the supply officer gets back on the ship because he ain't going to let you go for three months mm -hmm. because I was a head storekeeper then. Uh. But I loaded <laughs> everything I had into that sea bag. Dirty clothes, everything, and put on my shoulder and caught a LST in Incheon, Korea to Shanghai, China. My goodness. In Shanghai, China, I got on the USS Birkenridge, another supply, another, uh, supply ship. Uh, troop ship, we called them then. Okay. As I was going up on the gangplank, Frank Clements now, the boy that joined the Navy with me, I had no idea where that boy was. There he stood as I walked <laughs> up on the ship. Wow. So we came home. Coming home. We come home to, we got, we came to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And uh, we rode the train all the way to Jacksonville, right where we joined the Navy, mm -hmm. got tattooed. <laughs> and he and I both, we had $700. That's mustard out pay. That's what we had had, $700. Okay. So uh, we, we uh, bought civilian clothes, sport coat, and for $200. <laughs> Yay. $200. Uh, you know, I didn't have much money, so I can remember all those things. Uh, but <laughs> exactly. that's where we, that's where he and I, had, then we, I came on home, and, and uh, that's another story. Love that. Before we move to the next chapter of being home, I have to comment. You mentioned in high school your least favorite subject was geography. I can say your sense of geography has expanded just amazingly. Since then. <laughs> yeah, you you know, since then, I, I love history. <laughs> and I love, you know, and I've been around the world I've, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. since I've been out. And, uh, but just, it's... Uh, you know, being in the, in the service and the Navy, uh, it was a, a real, ex you grow up fast. Mm -hmm. Sure. I went in there as a, just a teenager, 18 years 18. old. We had to, we had no choice. You either went in the Army, you went in the Navy, uh, or some other Coast Guard, whatever. But uh, you, you, uh, you grow up fast, but when the time comes, you get, uh, like I say that whenever the mm -hmm. executive officer told us that we'd get out of this and lie, we'd be 
that's yeah. whatever you get to thinking about the hereafter. You, sure. You about ready to, I, I thought I was about ready to go. I can remember one time I didn't get mail call. Mail call was a big thing. If we'd be out to sea maybe two or three months. Mm -hmm. Didn't even see no land or nothing, be in the fighting zone. And we'd come back and get our mail. And one time I didn't have no mail. And I, and that's the only thing you had to look for. Guess a letter from your home, from your girlfriend. Uh, sure. And I was so depressed till I remember I was standing on the fantail of the ship. And I said, nobody loves me. Nobody oh. cares for me. Oh. What am I here for, you know? But the next time we had mail call, I had more mail than anybody. <laughs> it just got My delayed. mail got, they had to go through San Francisco and then the ships and my mail just got. Delayed. But you can, you, you can get depressed and uh, mm -hmm. things, uh, when, the, when the fighting gets close to you, mm -hmm. you, but you're just proud to be an American. And, Thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you for ser your service. And I'll tell you, it's also remarkable to me to hear your story and we appreciate so much your service. And it's not just a point in time, as you shared with us, that you contracted malaria and the asbestos um, infection yeah. still bothers you today. You shared with us your father in World War I contracted pneumonia, suffered from that, yeah. and then also had influenza. So, you know, it's, a, it's not just the really dramatic and terrifying experiences, but lifelong impacts that this service has on you. Well, so that's, <clears throat> that's not only, I lost a nephew, my brother's only son in, in mm -hmm. uh, Vietnam. Oh, he was in the son. Marines, 19 yeah. years old, he got killed. I'm so then sorry. Then my sister, oldest son, he got killed. He was in the Air Force and, mm -hmm. and coming home and the plane crashed. And so uh, it's, it's been in, in our family. The Godwins yeah. are people who serve yeah. our country. Thank yeah. you so much for yeah. that. You're back in Frostproof. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, I came back home, and uh, I had four years of eligibility of college. Okay, good. But in my mind, I knew I wasn't prepared for college because I didn't, I didn't study enough in high school. I went three years to summer school where it was only six months, mm -hmm. and you don't get that background. Mm -hmm. And uh, knowing that you got to go into the service, you don't study all that much either. But, you know, uh, and I came back home to Berea. Okay. And uh, I, I, they was picking citrus one day over in one of my neighbors. I came back home, and in the meantime, now my family has now got electricity. Yay. They had running water, and we had indoor toilet facilities. And so that was a plus. But anyway, I uh, said, well, I'm going to go over there and work, pick fruit one day, pick citrus. Mm hmm and uh, I didn't know much about picking the citrus, but <laughs> I went over and picked fruit for a half a day. Whew. I made $5. I put that fruit back, sack back up. I said, Royce, you can do better than this. <laughs> and uh, that was the end of my fruit picking. <laughs> in the meantime, I had, uh, back in high school, I had learned to cut meat. That's right. In the meat market. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I just kind of casual went into Mr. Futrell. He had a Futrell's store Futrell's there in Frostbrook, mm -hmm. one of the largest stores there. And that's where I worked before. And I asked him about a job. He said, Royce, I, I, the, the guy that's here now, a manager, he's fixed to go on vacation and you could take his place. Well, you know, here, I said, okay. But then they've inventoried every Saturday night to see if you made a profit for the week. Okay. You inventoried, you'd get through about midnight inventory. But this guy was not making a profit. And Mr. Future told me, he said, Royce, this guy is not making a profit. So I, I really worked at it. I said, I got two weeks to make an impression. <laughs> so uh, I really watched everything and uh, the stuff that he'd throw out in the garbage. I'd, cut that meat off of the bone, made hamburger, whatever. <laughs> well, I made a profit. Yay. The, the two weeks, the guy came back to go to work, and Mr. Futrell says, uh, uh, Royce is now the manager, and if you want to work, you can work under him. Well, that natural was the end of that. He didn't want to do that, and I don't blame him. So I started managing it 20 years ago, I guess, come out of the Navy, mm -hmm. 
and I had a couple of people older than I working for me. And I managed that meat market for 13 years. Okay. Till I was 33 years old. Good. good and I did good. I did, uh, uh, he, he treated me good. I was a manager and we had some of the best business in Frosty. I had the high class meat. I had the Maxes and the, and the Griffins Yay. and the, the high class, and I catered to them. And uh, at, back then, you didn't have Western beef like we have now. We had local, mm -hmm. the, the local farmers, the uh, ranchers, the butcher, and then, the, so I had uh, local meat coming in from different people. But Mr. Griffin, Ben Hill Griffin, Jr., he, uh, he had a ranch, and uh, I bought some meat from him. Okay. And his wife was one of my good customers. Okay. And uh, we both, uh, I got into Masonic Lodge. I was beginning to get, and he was a Masonic Lodge, he was a member. And he knew I loved football. And here I was, just a 20-year-old, and uh, not married at that time. And he'd take me to Gainesville, the University of Florida, to football games. How fun. Yes, he and Mr. Mr. Griffin, Miss Griffin, and me. And we'd come back, and he'd stop in Ocala at the Brahma. I remember that, the restaurant there. And, <laughs> right. And then I had to drive. He would ask me to drive from there to Frostproof. And here I was driving a big millionaire around, and me a little 20-year-old <laughs> <little 20 -year> <laughs> character. But I was a little older than that at that time. I was getting older. But, and we became friends, and, uh, and he did business with me, and we'd talk. And, so one of the trips, we was coming back from the University of Florida, and uh, I want to drop that story in just a minute. My father gave each one of us kids 95 acres of land back, mm -hmm. and, and at one year old, he uh, gave us a calf. And uh, so I bought my sister's 95 acres, and I was running cattle myself. I had a few head of cattle. and. Uh, it, it got to the point that uh, one of the friends of mine there at, at the Masonic Lodge says, uh, Royce, uh, this company, Atlantic Land Improvement Company, they've got 100 acres of good citrus land next to my property. You need to see if you can get a hold of that. And I got those wheels turned and yeah. talked to Mr. Griffin. Yeah. Well, I traded that 190 <laughs> acres I had for my sister. I bought that out. Hundred dollars an acre, and uh, and I traded that for a hundred acres of citrus land. And uh, this was before I went to work with Mr. Griffin, and uh, I had a hundred acres. I didn't have the money to set out a grove, so I thirty I sold thirty acres okay. for twenty one thousand dollars. That's seven hundred dollars an acre. Now that was a lot of money back then. That was in nineteen fifty nine. Okay, yeah. Nineteen fifty nine. I took that that uh, $21,000 mm -hmm. and cleared and set out 50 acres of land wow. in Orange Grove. And, uh, and I, I had 20 acres still left there. Well, the, the freeze came along in, in the early 60s and, the, and Donna came along with the hurricane. Uh, Donna the hurricane. That's right. And it knocked me down the freeze and knocked my 50 acres down to the dirt where I had it banked up. Uh. So I went to I went to, uh, well, I'll leave it there. Now I'm back with Mr. Griffin. So I uh, was coming back from Gainesville, and I said, Mr. Griffin, I've got, uh, uh, I've got 100 acres of land out there, citrus land I'd already traded. And I want to get in the citrus business. I can't go in any higher in this meat market. I don't want to go in competition with Mr. Futro. And... Uh, I'd had three years of FFA boy in Fort Meade. Now I was a future farmer, made straight A's in that subject. And he said, Royce, are you serious? Now at that time, I was uh, 33 years old. Okay. Had, was married and had family. He said, are you serious? And I said, yes, sir, I'm serious. He said, I'll hire you right now. <laughs> but we've got to go to Mr. Futrell. He was a, he was a Mason. Mm -hmm. And we've got to make this right with him. And, and he did, and we had a meeting together, and Mr. Griffith said, Mr. Fuchsel said, well, I know eventually I'm going to lose him anyway, so 
this is a good move. So uh, he said, I'm going to start you off as a supervisor of Polk County. Now, I hadn't had it other than three years of ag <laughs> at, in Fort Meade High School. Uh, I said, man, I, I got to use some psychology because they had older men that was foremans that I was coming out of a meat market and their boss. Well, that was a tough go, all right? And uh, so I started. Okay. He gave me a Jeep. And uh, one of the old gentlemen there was 65 years. He'd been there for years and years. And I use a little psychology. I says, I can't, being an ex-meat cutter, and, and they know I'm not a citrus man. I got, so I would ask them, what do you think about this particular job? What do you think is what kind of fertilizer we need to do? What? I'd get their opinion, and I'd let it go along with what my think. In the meantime now, I was going to school. Mm -hmm. at night. I was taking courses from University of Florida okay. Extension Department at Lake Alford. Absolutely. Under yeah. Dr. Pratt. Right. And I studied soil sciences and uh, deficiencies and toxicities and fertilizer, all of that. I didn't study no English, no math. I studied citrus. Mm -hmm. And I devoted my time strictly to citrus. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Griffin at that time, was in the House of Representatives uh, in Tallahassee. Okay, but right. he'd come home every week, he had an airplane. And my job was to go with him every weekend. Now, I just started now. And here I was, a supervisor of Polk County. <laughs> and he'd come home every weekend and take me on Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And we didn't do anything but look at citrus. And he had talked to me. He's one of the most intelligent citrus people that I've ever known. What an opportunity. And uh, yeah. uh, it, it was, uh, but it went along and uh, I studied hard, I worked hard, I devoted, uh, I really learned a lot from, from the older people that was working. But I was the boss. <laughs> and it worked out, it really worked out good. And now then, uh, before I retired, you had to have a degree in citrus, a master's mm -hmm. degree, you didn't have my job. And, but I, I studied in, in night school. I did go up to the University of Florida and took a, a rootstock course. In, uh, and I took correspondent courses mm -hmm. in elements of supervision. And I took a Dale Carnegie course. And uh, so that all helped me in management. Sure. And I've always managed something. Since I was 20 years old, I was managing <laughs> some, either meat market or citrus. Oh, I think you can go back to the days of managing your paper route. <laughs> I think it started at <laughs> well, age Well, that started. Yeah. And I, that reminded me of something. I had a man working for me that lived three miles from my house on a dirt road. And I carried him grit papers with 35 cents. Seven times I rode that bicycle. He never paid me. Oh. And later on, he worked for me. <laughs> In the orange groves. Oh, in the, I started to tell him, I want that 35 cents. That's but great. Can, and can, full eat, circle. Yes. And, and that same man, I, I, we were sitting out in orange grove. Uh, this was in 1960. Sitting out of Mercot. And uh, we almost had the job finished. 40 acre grove. We almost finished at 530 in the afternoon. We like one row. And I said, gentlemen, let's, let's finish this job so we can start a new job tomorrow. I was brought up that way, Mr. Griffin took. And uh, this guy says, Royce, what are you trying to do, kill us? <laughs> yeah. I said, no, I'm gonna get down there and I'm gonna help you set these trees, but I'd like to get this job finished so we can start a new job. That's, that's part of management. That's great uh, leadership, uh, Being that's able sure. to start tomorrow yeah. with a different job, a Absolutely. different idea. Great. So I went to, uh, uh, I, I was, like I said, Polk County Supervisor, and I continued on when Mr. Griffin go into ball games. Okay. I was always, and he was a big supporter of the University of Florida. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, uh, it, 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 at one time, now, in the meantime, I got married, and you know, I had children, we'd come mm -hmm. to that, but Mr. Griffin was, uh, being inducted into the Hall of Fame, University of Florida Hall of Fame. Right. 
And it was in the paper. And my wife said to me, she said, let's go. And I said, okay, that's, that's, I think we'll go. We'll just get some tickets and go to that. So we went. And none, no, nobody was there from the company but my wife and I. And he entered, he saw us and he introduced me to, you know, his citrus production man. And, and uh, he told me at that time, he said, Royce, you don't never have to buy a football ticket to the University of Florida. As long as I live, you've got a football ticket with me. And that held true that I went to all the ball games and I on the airplane and flew with him and wherever. He took me. That, that, that somehow though, that just really set him off. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, well, certainly it's a fabulous career, a long career, in one of Polk County's most important industries, and that's agriculture and certainly for a company and name who, you know, is just known for citrus. It's um, interesting, and um, no, we just learned this year of the closing of Ben Hilgriff and the Packing Company, and I just wonder how you felt when you read about that. Well, uh, Ben Hill III called me mm -hmm. and told me that before it was out in the So paper, it wasn't a surprise. Would, and uh, we have that disease now, greening mm -hmm. uh, disease, it's uh, really a Devastating. Disastrous in the mm -hmm. citrus. Mm -hmm. Citrus business is tough go now. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's always had problems, at, but we always overcome those problems. Mm -hmm. And this greening is a tough situation. Yeah. It's, a, it, it's a little silly that flies around in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And it can land on a citrus leaf and then it, it penetrates all down into the root system and the root system starts dying out. Mm -hmm. And then the top starts going out. It, it's contagious and they spend a lot of money. I, uh, I can remember back in cost of production, it used to be $1,000 an acre. Okay. Uh, roughly, and uh, now it's around $2,000 an acre. And wow. we're only producing a fourth of the amount of citrus. Right. We, right. we used to, when I was manager, I've got, I haven't even got into that detail when I was promoted up. But anyway, uh, we used to produce like 250 million boxes in Florida. Now it's sixty something million. Right. And it used to be our second industry in Florida, tourism one, and citrus two. I, I don't know now where it stands, but it's 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 a tough it's a tough go. You you're producing a fourth of the amount of fruit and yet the cost of production is twice as much. Right. You don't have to be a mathematician <laughs> yeah. to figure that out that you're not making the money. Right. Hopefully we'll find some great cures either for that or a resistant root stock so that industry will be strong yeah. again. I want to ask you though, you had this career in Frostproof and I know that you were um, selected Mr. Frostproof. How does one get the title Mr. Frostproof? Well, that's another story. I was very, uh, I was very active in the community. I was an American Legion. I was in the Rotary Club, I was in the Lions Club, uh, I was a Mason, I was uh, on the board of directors of the First Federal in Lake Wells at that time. No, I came on that later. But uh, I was very active uh, and uh, Mr. Griffin one day asked James Lankford, my friend, friend, who was manager of Griffin Motor Company. Okay. Ask him who says, no, James told me this, it, uh, who works for me can be elected to the city council? And James says, Royce Godwin. And Mr. Griffin came to me and he said, Royce, you ever thought about running for city council? <laughs> and I hadn't. I said, no, sir, I never have thought about that. But that meant to me, yeah, you better get ready to run for the city council. And uh, so, and, and I did. And he had reasons. Back then, there were seven of us on the city council. Okay. And you had the Maxi, you had the Maxis over here, and the Griffins over here, and the Sullivans over here, and each one had their own representatives on the city council. Mm -hmm. It was a big deal, Frostproof. Yeah. And come to find out, uh, he owned a concentrate plant now, and uh, on Fourth Street. It was open uh, as public to the public, and he had a concentrate plant there, and uh, he had a feed mill that you had to go over that 
public road to, to get to the feed mill. And, and really, he was hired more people than anybody in Frosty. He had a concentrate plant, packing a house, mm -hmm. production people. And uh, I think that was one of the reasons uh, I, I had to get on, the, I got on the city council. And we f finally closed that street on a four to three vote. It, uh. But, you know, and, and, and why would people fight production and somebody that was really hiring more people in the little old town of Frostproof, 3,000 people? But that's the way it was. That was yeah. politics. That's politics. That's po politics. But anyway, that's how I uh, got to each year they had Mr. Frostproof. Uh, <laughs> I love it. I, I got on there one year. And, but I had the, uh, in elections, city elections, it was, uh, uh, you had to politic to even get elected. It uh, only paid $5 a month. It wasn't for the money. Uh, but. <laughs> I was in charge of the American Legion. They had American Legion Auxiliary. So I had the, the women on that side. They had the Easter Star on the Masonic Temple. Mm -hmm. I was in that. So they, they politicked for me. And I was <laughs> on there 12 years. And uh, I never got beat. Good for I you. I finally didn't run because I, I moved out of Frostproof. But, uh, Good for you. Congratulations. Uh, Great yeah, career. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. well, yeah. well run yeah. career. Yeah. Tell me about your children. Anybody still in Frostproof? Or well, my oldest son's a retired mortician. Okay. He uh, worked for Mary Nelson Funeral Home. Uh, That's in Lake there, Wales? Lake Wales, but he managed the one in Frostproof. We okay. had a big, and uh, that's my oldest son. Now, he's retired now. Okay. 69 years old. And I got a, my daughter is uh, <clears throat> in, uh, worked for Auburn University. She's old enough to retire. She's married to a Methodist minister, and they're doing well. And my youngest son graduated from the University of Florida, and he's in the golf business. Uh -huh. now, There's your gator, I don't though. know how good, <laughs> I don't know how well that makes any money, but that's, that's another We're story. We're in Florida. It's, it's a way of life. <laughs> that's a way of life. He <laughs> loves golf, and that's what he's uh, mm -hmm. been into. And, and he had a golf business there in Orlando. Orlando. Okay. No, none of your children My took up the cattle business. <laughs> no, you know, none of them was interested in citrus. Okay. And uh, it was a Godwin tradition to always leave something for your children. Mm -hmm. And I formed, uh, I had uh, finally got them grooves up. And uh, I. I, I sold out my citrus groves to, Mr. to the company, okay. Ben Hill Griffin. Mm -hmm. When I retired as manager, I, re, mm -hmm. I sold my groves to the company. And I formed a corporation. And my three children, I give them all of the, mm -hmm. the citrus. So they've done pretty well. In, yeah. in, uh, Good. And I've given them the, the citrus. And I, I just got back from a trip to Daytona Beach. Tell us about that. What was that all about? Yeah. I have 28 children. In, in my family. I have uh, 11 grand, great grandchildren, uh, seven grandchildren, and three children, and, and all of their spouses. So I have for many, many years took them different places, Charleston, Savannah, and, but we've been going to Daytona probably 10 or 15 years. Lovely. And I rent condos there, and, and all of them gathered, every one of them gathers together in, as a family. Great. And I'm planning on uh, Investing some money just for that occasion, because I'm 91 years so old. So it can continue. So it can continue. Leave a little uh, heritage We talked legacy. about that this past weekend. Perfect. That I'm going to leave them enough money that they can carry it on for should for many years. That's lovely. I wonder, do you ever roast hot dogs out on the beach when you're together, like in the old days? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got blistered a little bit. <laughs> you just roasted your yeah. feet instead yeah. of the hot dogs. Yeah. You told me about recently traveling to Washington, D.C. on one of the honor flights to the World War II Memorial. What, what was that experience like Oh, for that you? was a great experience. I read in the newspaper, in the Lakeland Ledger, mm -hmm. that they were doing this. This is the first group that mm -hmm. went. And I, I said, that'd be interesting. So I, uh, I called up a number. They had a number. Mm -hmm. And they called me back and sent a questionnaire of what I did and where and my background in, in the service. And they called me back and said, you're in. And uh, 
it was a uh, it was a great experience. You know, I was uh, I, don't, I don't remember now, but maybe three or four years ago. But uh, you you needed a a companion to go with you mm -hmm. to look after you. I said I don't need no companion. <laughs> uh, I could walk. I don't need a wheelchair. I said yeah, you got to have a wheelchair. And uh, so I didn't have a companion. I didn't need one, and but they named one for me. And lo and behold, it come that uh, Preston Troutman, oh. uh, who was the uh, officer in the Marines, right, wanted to, to be a, a companion. And it, they said, "Do you know Roy's guy?" He said, "Yeah, I know Roy. He worked for the company, and of course, he worked for the company too okay. for years." Mm -hmm. And uh, so he was my uh, he was an officer in the Marines, and he he. He, he took me around in a wheelchair at, whenever we was in the building. I said, here's an old Marine, an officer pushing an old seaman first class around in a wheelchair. Fun. But it was a great experience. Great experience. And, uh, it was cold. Ooh. We went up there. It, it was cold. Um, but we went to the World War II Museum, mm -hmm. the Korean Museum, the Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, uh, and, uh, you know, we... At the airport, I believe it was at the airport, that they opened up letters that school children had wrote letters to us veterans at at the airport, and that's what we had to wait for the flight. They opened up all these letters that they give each one of them, and it's for little children there in Lakeland and in the Polk County, recognizing us that and is thanking us wonderful. for the uh, and. We left early in the morning, uh, and uh, we got back about eight or nine o'clock in Lakeland Airport, in there. and there was a band there playing, and people everywhere flying flags and, and uh, welcoming, and it was just a lot of tears shed. A lot of tears, yeah, yeah very emotional. Yeah. Well, it was certainly an amazing service that you all provided it's our country, good. and. Um, Anything that you know this country can do to say thank you to you all yeah. for that amazing service, we should yeah. be able to do that. Thank so I'm glad you did that. I'm glad you shared that with us. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. I've seen the memorial. It's very emotional. Yeah. You know, it does speak. Well, they're still doing it, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I, I think it's a great thing mm -hmm. to recognize the veteran. You know, the, the, a lot of people in this country don't really recognize what went on no. in yeah. World War II. We need and, to remember the, our history. In the Vietnam War, in the Korean War. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not interested or, or something. But yeah. I can go to places. Uh, uh, I've got a World War II. I just went to Cuba and uh, on a trip. And I wore my Navy World War II veteran. And I had a lot of people thank you. Thank you for the service. Good. And Great. Uh, makes you feel good. Good. Yeah. You should. Yeah. You have an amazing life. Yeah. Your history is just fantastic. Um, the connections to Polk County, two of the most significant agricultural endeavors between cattle and citrus. You've had history and involvement in those industries, serving our country in every generation. Yeah. It's just a great story. The Godwin story is a wonderful story, and I thank you so much for allowing us an opportunity to hear something about it. Now, I wonder if you have a memory, special memory, or any special story, or anything you'd just like to share with us. Well, I'd like to go back to my earlier days with Ben Hill Griffin okay. Incorporated. Sure. Uh, I was 33 years old. Young. And when I started, and as I told you, I was a supervisor of Polk County Grove. And uh, Mr. Griffin, now I'm talking about Ben Hill Griffin Jr. Now, he okay. was a founder of our company. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was really like a father to me in a, in a lot of aspects. Right. And, uh, it, you know, I, I started as, a, as making $400 a month. I was making $600 a month managing a meat market. <laughs> oh, and Mr. Griffin <laughs> asked me when I went to work, he said, how much do you, do you make? And I said, I make $600 a month. And that's what I was making. He said, well, I can't start you that. I'll start you at 400. So I told my wife, and uh, I told her, I says, just tighten the belt a little bit, and I'll bring us back. 
and uh, she did that. She was not a spendthrifty, but uh, she she bared with me, and in about three months he raised me back up. But he did that. I had to prove to him that I was going to dedicate myself to that company and, and educate myself in citrus. Mm -hmm. And I had to prove that to him before I got, before, I, and uh, the production manager at the time I started, I was right under him. And uh, he wanted me to learn, uh, learn to drive a tractor. <laughs> you know? And Mr. Griffin told him, I didn't hire him as a tractor driver. I hired him as a supervisor of Polk County Groves and I expect you to help him. And he did, and, okay. and he did. And so, but uh, when that grove that I was telling you about, and, and I, the freeze came along and froze me down to the dirt. I had no money. And I went to Mr. Griffin and I said, Mr. Griffin, no, no I don't have any money. I spent all my money, the $21,000 mm -hmm. growing this 50 acres. Now I'm killed to the dirt. Mm -hmm. He said, son, you take care of that grove just like you would, and my groves or any other grove, you charge it to the company, and whenever that grove gets big enough, you pay back to the company. That is incredible. That is incredible. Mm -hmm. You talk about thousands and thousands of dollars. And, uh, in the, and you know, and, uh, and he did that, and I, and, he, and I paid him back, and, and, and uh, but, I had 20 acres left out of that 100 acres, mm -hmm. and Ben Hill the third, Ben Hill Griffin the mm third, -hmm. was 18 years old, and he said, "Royce, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll clear that 20 acres. When I say clear, that push up all the trees, and I'll set it out in Mercots. And five years, I'll pay for the expenses for five years, and in five years, you deed Ben Hill the third one half of it." And we did that. We set out that 20 acres, and uh, Ben Hill the third. That was his first grove that oh, he how ever owned. That's who incredible. is now the CEO story. of Ben Hill Griffin Incorporated? And that's the first grove he ever owned, and they called it the B and R. That's Ben and Royce. That is a yeah. great story. So now, Murcotts is that a shipping fruit or a packing shipping, or is it a juice fruit? The Murcott. Murcott was it's a, a Back then was the most expensive citrus you could buy. It's a honey tangerine. So it's packing shipping, it's not pa juicing. It's a, strictly a packing. And that yeah. was his first grove. First grove that Ben Hill the third ever. From near owned. twenty acres. And he and I owned that grove together, and we owned that grove for many, many years. That is. And we great. never had a question. I managed the grove, and what we did, he owned ten acres, I owned ten acres, but we split the profit, we split the expense. Everything, the water, and we just did it. Never had a crossword about it. Is Never. it still producing? Is that particular? No, it, they finally, uh, about two years ago, uh -huh. they pushed it up. It was it greening, but it was greening. Yeah. It was one of the most profitable. That was one of the most profitable, profitable groves, and and Murcotts was one of the highest mm -hmm. expense, mm -hmm. highest paid citrus yeah. that I've ever known. Great but Ben story. Hill III and I owned that grove together for, for his first grove. Thank you. I like that. That's a great story. Now back to Mr. Griffin. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, as I say, he, he taught me a lot. He taught me more than the book would ever teach me. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. He was one of the most uh, knowledgeable citrus from the seed, from the plant the seed to the finished product and the concentrate. But he... Uh, he, he knew, he brought up in it. Mm -hmm. Now he studied. He'd call you about four or five o'clock in the morning no. and, and with an idea. Oh, and he always said, if you have an idea and you don't express that idea, there's no need to even have the idea to begin with. It may be worth something. That's interesting. And that That's was one of his philosophies. And, and you, if you work for Ben Hill Griffin, Jr., I would say then and mm -hmm. now, you had to be dedicated. They paid you well. They took care of you with benefits. But you had to be dedicated to citrus, to their groves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was going to buy a grove one time. I'd, I'd sold my grove. I'd, I, would, I had that 50-acre grove, and I got it up 15 years old. And I sold that grove for, uh, for $5,000 an acre. 
And Mr. Griffin, he advised me, he said, I think, and back then that was a lot, $250,000 to an old boy from Berea <laughs> that, you know, I, that's a lot of money to me. And uh, then now I wanted to reinvest that money mm -hmm. in Citrus. But he called me in the office one morning at 7 o'clock. And he said, Royce, you're my man. You're my production man. I want your brains working on my grooves. I'll pay you for that. I don't want you to buy that groove. I don't want you to buy any grooves. Interesting. And, and I, I, you know, I had an old abatum. I said, well, I, I've got to. So I didn't buy that groove. No? Uh, and, uh, and, and he's right. It was a conflict of interest that uh, he you, wanted me thinking about yeah, his citrus. Your interests would have been not divided. Not my citrus. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, uh, and, and that's, uh, that's what, and when he passed away, Mr. Griffin, Ben Hill III now, mm -hmm. that owned the 20 acres with me. I love that. He came to me and he said, Royce, you can now buy orange groves. Okay. And which I did. I, I bought some into partnership and then I ended up buying 100 acres of good citrus on Moody Lake in Frostbeef. But uh, Mr. Griffin, you know, he died, he died at 79 years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the smartest citrus people. And when I was on the city council, he was in the, I think he was a senator then. You know, he run for governor at one right. time. Right, I remember but that. He was a senator. And he flew me and a friend of mine, Grady Wilson, up in his little airplane to Tallahassee uh, to introduce to the, to the politicians two city councilmen, and we both was probably about 39 or 40 years old. <laughs> what? Uh, but he was, uh, I had a great uh, journey in Citrus, and uh, I was on the Citrus Commission, uh, uh, Polk County Advisory Committee. Okay. I was on there with uh, Dudley Putnam. Oh and, my, uh, yeah, another and, icon. Uh, that's right, his son, uh, his grandson running mm -hmm. for governor. And uh, W.G. Rowe, Mm -hmm. It was on that committee, yeah. and I was just an arch up dyke, which is big. And, uh, Another so I was on that committee with them guys, and I, and I was just a peon, but I was on that committee with them, and I, I worked on up till uh, Mr. Griffin uh, made me as production manager of his groves uh, of the company in Citrus. Well, thank, thank you for that, those stories. Certainly, Ben Hill Griffin is recognized as a, a, a very important leader in the, um, agriculture, in the citrus industry. So it's nice to hear some little insider special yeah. stories about his personality and his work style. And thank you for that. And thank you for being with us today. This has been a wonderful opportunity to get to know the Godwin family a little more. Thank you so much.